Hello and uh, thank you all for coming. <clears throat> My name is Danny and I'm a co-founder and uh, responsible for security at SNEAK. We are um, at a startup based here in Tel Aviv and in London and uh, we're building security tools for developers to help them use open source securely. In my past, I've been working in, in a bunch of different startups doing security and, and development work, and most recently as a CTO in a security consulting company, uh, focusing on research and crypto analysis. And by not doing security research at work, I, I uh, do that for fun. I really enjoy playing uh, capture the flag games with my team, plus 10. And uh, we had the honor to win the uh, last CCC and uh, Google captured the flag competitions uh, last year. <laughs> so I want to open up by saying that open source is awesome. And as a result, its usage has exploded. So when we look at the different languages and the, and the uh, package managers of this, we see these huge numbers of, of uh, published packages with more than 100 uh, packages, 100,000 packages on, on, uh, on Ruby, Ruby gems and, and Py, uh, PyPy, 200,000 packages uh, on Java's Maven, and leading them all NPM with more than half a million packages, JavaScript packages that are mostly used in Node.js application and front-end JavaScript. So just uh, last week, more than 3 billion packages, that's a b billion packages were downloaded from NPM alone. These are staggering numbers and they are keep on growing uh, in an insane pace. So, a typical application nowadays has somewhere between 100 to 1000 dependencies. Some of them are direct dependencies, these uh, dependencies that we bring in by choice, we, we pull them in but the majority of them are actually indirect ones, those that are, we pull in in a nested way by the direct dependencies going deeper. So it leads to a situation where this is our code, the actual code we wrote, and this is our app. And the, the orange part here are the dependencies that we pulled in. And this is actually a positive slide, right? Because we can we can create all this orangish value by focusing only on the core of our application. So with that, of course, comes a security risk. Do we even know what dependencies we use in our applications? Do we know if the developers of these dependencies, of these packages, had any security expertise? And most importantly, do we know whether these dependencies has any known security vulnerabilities? Clearly, this is a big risk, and that's why using components with no known vulnerability is, vulnerabilities is on the list of OWASP top 10 most critical types of vulnerabilities. <laughs> so now let's see three examples, three recent examples of vulnerabilities and types of vulnerabilities and that affect open source packages. And later we will uh, look into how we can prevent this. So let's start with um, Apache struts. This is, who here heard about the Apache struts vulnerability? Okay, I see like half of, uh, of the audience um, have heard. So Apache struts is, is a critical severity remote code execution vulnerability. It was found and fixed in March this year but it got all over the news again in September when Equifax, one of the biggest credit reporting agencies, uh, announced that they got breached. And as a result, 143 million customer records were exposed. That's nearly uh, half of the US population. So the vulnerability is actually very easy to exploit. There is no authentication needed. All the attacker that, uh, needs to do is, is send a single HTTP POST request to the web application. And instead of sending this, uh, the, the expected, the standard uh, content types, what the attacker does is basically sends an ONGL expression. ONGL stands from Object Graph Navigation Language. It's an, expre it's an expression language for getting and setting properties in, in Java objects. And it's actually a very rich language. We can do all sorts of stuff with that. So in the code, one of the parsers, the one that handles file uploads, 
when when it sees this content length, uh, it, it, this content length is illegal, I invalid, so there is an exception thrown. And this is the part of the code that handles this exception. We see that a function called build error message is called, where the exception is passed as, a, as an argument. And that, ex and that message, that exception, contains our malicious ONGL code. So then inside the build error message, we see that another function is called. This is the find text uh, function. And this, that's the point where the vulnerability is triggered. That function, the find text function, is actually evaluating. It's, it's a known functionality, documented one. It evaluates ONGL expressions. So basically what happened is that in an attempt to generate a meaningful error message, we ended up evaluating ONGL as uh, expression, ONGL script. So this is the full payload. What's interesting about this is basically what all, all it does is, is create this process builder class, which is a Java class to execute shell commands. Uh, just for that, uh, in the end, it will be able to, to run any, any shell command. So that's, that was the, um, the, the Apache Struts remote code execution vulnerability. What's interesting to see is the timeline. This vulnerability was actually ex uh, uh, responsibly disclosed by a Chinese researcher to Apache uh, in, uh, earlier this year, before uh, merge, that's all we know. And uh, on the 6th of merge, uh, Apache released the fix. They fixed the vulnerability, they went out with a public announcement, and uh, two releases, uh, two uh, minor releases were, uh, sorry, two major releases were created. And less than one day after the release, we, we've seen uh, exploits, exploit script appearing both on GitHub, on ExploitDB, on Metasploit. So less than one day, and that's exactly when uh, attacks were, were, were seen in the, in the wild, exploiting this vulnerability. Then on May 13th, it's more than, it's about two months, more than two months, uh, and until the end of July, and uh, that's when the Equifax breach happened. So that they didn't know exactly what was going on even in the end of that period. They just brought the servers down and that's when they brought in uh, Mandian Labs to investigate this breach. And in September, um, beginning of September, they went out with a public announcement. So the story here is that a known vulnerability that had a fix in, in, the, in the 6th of March was, wasn't um, fixed, wasn't uh, addressed during all this uh, uh, period for more than four and a half months. So that was uh, a normal ability in Apache Struts. Now let's uh, look in, in another example. These are malicious packages. Um, so in August uh, this year, a few months back, 40 uh, malicious packages were found on NPM. And one month later, same thing happened, this time affecting Python packages. So in both cases, a technique called typo squatting was used to um, basically lure developers to install malicious packages uh, during their work. So just like in the original typo squatting attacks for the main names, uh, where the attacker would register a similar looking domain name for the original site, this case, in this case Google, same thing happens for, for malicious packages. So this is an NPM package cross dash env. It's a simple package that basically helps you set and get environment variables um, and across different operating systems. And this is the legitimate package cross, cross dash env. But the malicious package appeared that was named cross env which is actually, in a way, more intuitive. It's like, in, on NPM, you don't see much, uh, like, you, you see more packages that has no dashes than those that do. So, very easy to, to, to uh, do a mistake here. So, again, this is, one is the legitimate, other than malicious. Same happened for jQuery. There was a package named jQuery.js. And if we look at the package JSON file of that malicious package, we see that the name of the package is crass cross env, but what it does is actually brings the original, the legit cross env dependency. So basically providing the needed functionality for the developer. And actually they were nice enough to credit the original author with, with the, with the uh, release. 
But in addition, we, we, we see this, this line that I'm not sure you can see clearly, but the post install node package setup thing. Um, this is a post install hook. Basically, this is a command to be a shell command to be executed as soon as the installation of the package is complete. So looking at that script, we see that what it does is collects all the environment variables and base64 encodes them and just sends them in a simple post request to the, uh, to the attacker's uh, server. So the idea here is to, to basically leak uh, uh, environment variables which might con uh, contain some, some uh, credentials and, and uh, authentication tokens, uh, both on the developer's machine, but I think more importantly on the build systems, the Jenkins, Travis machines, where almost certainly you have some sort of credentials, some sort of secrets that uh, are used to pull uh, the code from, from source repositories or deploy the code to, uh, to your uh, servers, Amazon or Google. So um, that was malicious packages. And the last example is, has to do with Node, uh, Node.js buffer implementation. So, Node.js buffer, it's a, it's a simple data type, it's a buffer, and it has uh, a bunch of different constructors. One is from a string, uh, this one is simple, you just provide a string and, and, and it creates a buffer, initializing that buffer with the provided string. Nothing fancy. The other one it receives an integer, basically a size. So, what you would expect if you generate a buffer with a length of 10, you would expect to see a nice clean buffer like so. But what actually happens is that you get the buffer of length 10, but it contains some, some data. It's not zeroed out like we've seen in the previous example. So first of all, why, is, why does it happen? This is not a bug, this is a documented uh, behavior. And this is something that we typically see in, in a lower level languages like C and C++, but definitely uh, not expecting to see that on, in, in JavaScript. So the reason it happens is basically for uh, performance. When, when you ask to allocate a buffer, usually the next thing you do is populate that buffer with some data. So here the Node.js runtime basically trying to save some time and gives the responsibility of initializing the buffer to the developer. Because, again, like, why initialize the buffer when the next thing you will do is copy that buffer, the uh, data into that buffer? And this data is basically previously used memory of the process. That's what we've seen. So this is, again, a documented behavior. And, and this one thing, this one behavior, weird, unexpected behavior in JavaScript, in Node.js, caused Many, uh, many vulnerabilities, cause vulnerabilities in many NPM packages. These are uh, memory exposure vulnerabilities, uh, sort of similar to uh, herd bleed. And this is uh, just a partial list of those vulnerabilities. And for sake of this presentation, I want to focus on, on one such example. And this is the Mongoose uh, package. <coughs> Mongoose is a very popular uh, NPM package for uh, working with a uh, MongoDB database. So let me now switch to, um, to the terminal in the browser and show you the, the, this vulnerability. So, all right. Just make it bigger. Okay, so this is, can you see that well? Okay, so this is our, um, our to-do app. It's a demo application. We can add some items like a good uh, uh, to-do app. It lets us uh, add items. So I'll write buy meal, buy meal here. Hopefully the Wi-Fi holds. Yeah, okay, so I'll Okay, so what I, and just to look at, uh, so, okay, so every to do item here is stored in a Mongo database, MongoDB. So the schema for, uh, uh, for this item, for a to do item, is basically uh, this. We see that every to do item is stored in a buffer and it has another field, the date it got updated. That's all. 
Hopefully you can see that. Yep. So that's all we know. So now, um, as an attacker, what I would want to do is somehow provide a number here, right? Like send this number so that on the server side, a buffer will be created, but using the integer constructor, not the string. Here it didn't work. I, I provided the number, right? But it was added as a string. So let's try to see if we can, if we can somehow send this uh, uh, value as a number and, and see if we can leak some memory from the server. So I'll switch to a terminal here. And what we'll do is begin with just uh, sending a regular uh, post request. So uh, I'll say fix bike. I'll pipe it to the HTTP utility form. Let me just copy the URL. This is the create endpoint. And do that. So we see that we, we submitted the post uh, fix bike. And if we refresh here, we see that item. So nothing, nothing happened yet. But this being an OGS application that uses a, a library called body parser, we can submit the same request as JSON, okay? So this was a content type application form URL and code. But if we change, do the same thing, and, but send the string as JSON, we then can manipulate the type. So let me just show you if I switch it into a JSON thing. This is, let's make it a JBike. And this, and here we change to JSON. So we see that this time we send this as JSON, the content type of the application JSON. And if we look at our application, indeed the item was added. But the cool part is with JSON, we can control the type. So we can send this not as, as a string, but do something like that. And sending, and we already can see that something different happened. And when we back, go back to the application, we see this. So we caused to create a buffer, to construct a buffer from an integer. And again, this is the way Node behaves. It just uses, shows you uninitialized, previously used memory and, and in that process. And the cool part is that if we do that, uh, we can basically just show uh, the return, the, the result, the, what, the value that uh, uh, of the item that is added and base 64 decode that. So we see the memory coming. We actually see some strings here. Uh, this is, might be part of the, of the source code. And let's repeat that for say 100 times and pipe it into temp man dump and in a different, okay, I need to do that I should have done that with a, a double thing to, to append to a file. Yeah, live demos. So again, let's do it like that. And here, let's tail mem dump. And yeah, so, so what we're seeing is, is the this is real memory coming from Heroku servers, from the node process of Heroku servers. And of course, well, first we can see some, some actual recognizable string. If we, uh, if we see here, we see some string prototype thing. This is part of source code. Uh, but of course, this memory can contain keys and anything, um, anything sensitive that, that the application holds. OK, so that was buffer. Let me just switch back to the presentation. Okay. Five minutes, all right. Perfect. Cool. So yeah, that, 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 that application is also on, 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 on the GitHub. Uh, you're welcome to look at it. it. It basically shows different vulnerabilities coming from uh, dependencies you can, you can pull in, uh, in into your application, not having to do anything with the code you write yourself. So now the question is, we've seen these three real life examples from uh, uh, recent vulnerabilities, CPU vulnerabilities, and now let's see what we can do to protect ourselves. So when it comes to dependencies, basically there are two things, two steps. First is we want to uh, bring our applications 
to a good, healthy, secure state. We want to scan all the application, find the known vulnerabilities in the dependencies, and then, of course, fix them by upgrading, uh, upgrading away to, to a non-vulnerable version, or when, when it's not possible, to patch this. So after the first two steps, we, we come to a point where our applications are in a secure state. But now we need to make sure to, uh, so to prevent uh, introducing new vulnerabilities to our code. So this is something we, we can do as part of our, um, we should do continuously as part, part of our test, security tests in, 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 in build systems. And the idea here is for, to look for every changes that the developers may make, to look for uh, the added dependencies during those changes and see if they introduce any known vulnerabilities. And lastly, even when we don't change the code, we would want to know about newly published, newly disclosed vulnerabilities that affect our applications. So that's the, the, the last part, the respond part. And this is exactly where Equifax uh, uh, missed, right? Because they probably didn't change the code, it was just a deployed application that was out there. And one day, there was this high severity vulnerability published. So they didn't know, well, I, I don't know exactly what happened there, but anyway, there was a four month window of, uh, of being exposed and not addressing this issue. So the good news is that it all can be automated. When we look at our dependencies, this, all the tests, all the, all the things I mentioned before, this should be all completely automatic. And there are tools, there are different tools to do that. A good place to start is, is OWASP dependency check. It can help you find no vulnerabilities, no CVE vulnerabilities in your code. And of course, you're more than welcome to try sneak out. It is also free for open source. So that is, that is it. I think I have a few minutes for questions, right? Yeah. Um, any questions? Yeah. So at the moment, well, first, there, there is the tool, tools that I mentioned. So those typically you uh, deal with higher level uh, libraries, okay? And compiled libraries, you mean languages like C or, or libraries that are, uh, for example, bundled libraries. So many of the libraries on NPM have inside some compiled code, like uh, binaries. C and C++. So again, this is more challenging, definitely. That's a, a more challenging. None of the uh, tools I mentioned actually uh, provides a solution for that. And that's, that's something that I, I, I can later would love to, to mention, uh, to talk about um, some tools that I know, but there is no perfect solution at the moment, sadly. <laughs> the, the, the tools I mentioned are, are better working for, uh, for a higher level languages. Yeah. Because that's where you actually um, have um, the manifest files that you can traverse all the dependencies deeper, right? And um, yeah. More questions? Oh. How can tools like Snake handle things like typosquatting? So, typosquatting, uh, basically, as soon as we've seen those uh, malicious packages, we just added them to our uh, database. So, that, that's the idea, basically. This uh, packages became kind of like packages with vulnerabilities, right? And uh, those who use them and uh, actually have them, again, haven't changed their code, just uh, have them as part of their dependencies somewhere deep were alerted and fixed pull request was open. So there are different uh, alerting methods that uh, we, we do to, to kind of help you uh, know Okay, cool. Thank you.